Okay, hey, AP Psych. So I'm recording this review video in case you weren't in class on Friday or you're doing some review to prepare for the quiz tomorrow. So I basically put together all the slides that we've used throughout this unit, which you also have access to, but I added in a few more things, got rid of the like do now activity, stuff like that. So it's just all the information I need. So let me, here we go. Okay. So if you would like to use the Quizlet review page that we have set up for the class, this is a great resource to, um, to use. It has pretty much every module in it. So just go to the review page. You'll scroll till you find modules 9 through 15, which is what the quiz will be covering. Um, so definitely take advantage of that if you are somebody who benefits from um, kind of like a flashcard review or any of the activities there. Okay. So here we are. Okay, so I'm basically going through modules 9 through 15 really quickly. This is just another resource if you're like, yeah, I was in class, but I didn't fully get this or whatever it might be. Just a way to listen to me go through all this information. So we started this unit, module 9, um, talking about neurons, the smallest thing. You guys ate a bunch of candy. Um, so neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system. That's the main thing to understand about neurons when we're looking at this for the AP test. But why we talk about neurons is because they're essentially what enable us to communicate, um, what enables our thoughts, our actions, memories. They are the things that are sending all these messages throughout our body constantly, all the time. Here is a picture of a neuron. You're not going to have to label a neuron on the quiz, but you are going to need to know certain parts of it. So remember, we have the cell body, which supports the, the cell. Then we have the dendrites. The dendrites, um, they receive these messages from other cells, so up here. They travel down the axon, which is covered by the myelin sheath. The axon is what passes the messages from the cell body to other neurons, muscles, or glands. It's covered by the myelin sheath, which helps speed up the neural impulses. And basically an action potential sends it. Remember, this is like an all or nothing response. It's not like a really hard one's going to send it faster or like a small response is going to send it slower. It's basically, it either hits that threshold and the message is sent or it doesn't. It travels along the axon and then it gets to the terminal branches of the axon. Um, this is where they form junctions with other cells. In order for it to jump to another cell, remember it has to cross this thing called the synaptic gap. It doesn't happen immediately. There's a little bit of a, a space, a very, very, very small space, but jobs, job, jobs, <laughs> it jumps over the synaptic gap. And then that message is translated to other cells, other muscles, whatever it might be. So then we talked about neurotransmitters and there's lots of different kinds of neurotransmitters. We focused on a few of them, but to remind us, a neurotransmitter is the body's chemical messengers. So the important part here is chemical. Neurons are not chemical messengers. They're electrical, right? Neurotransmitters, they balance or imbalance the levels of chemicals that we have in our body. And they transmit these messages between neurons or from neurons to muscles. So what do they impact? Well, they impact a lot of different things, our thoughts, our actions, and our emotions. That's why many of the neurotransmitters that we talked about are related to things like memory, depression, anxiety, stuff like that. So these are some of the neurotransmitters that we talked about. Some of the ones that come up more commonly on the AP test are acetylcholine, serotonin, and probably dopamine. So the first three up here, that doesn't mean that norepinephrine, GABA, or glutamate aren't going to be there. But those are the ones that are more commonly talked about. So acetylcholine, remember, helps with, um, it helps enable muscle action, memory, and learning. If you don't have enough acetylcholine, that's associated with memory loss or something like Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is the happy one, right? It's the one that when we think of dopamine, we usually think of being happy. Um, but it also, the biggest thing it does is it influences our movement, learning, attention, and emotion. So if you have too much of it, 
you're going to be overactive. Um, so an oversupply could lead to kind of an overactive brain, overactive functioning, whereas an undersupply could lead to not as not as much functioning, um, could be decreased mobility, things like that. Serotonin is the one that we typically think about when we're looking at depression. Um, serotonin affects our mood, our hunger, our sleep, and arousal. If you have a normal level of serotonin, congratulations. Um, if you have an undersupply, it's typically linked to depression, and that's why certain drugs that are called SSRIs help with balancing it out so you can feel better um, and not as depressed. Then we have norepinephrine, helps control alertness and arousal. GABA, uh, which is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. I said in lecture that GABA is something that um, you might need more of in order to help you sleep because if you don't have enough, you are going to be an insomniac. Um, and then glutamate, the way to remember this one is we see the word, the letters G-L-U at the beginning, glue. You pretty much assume that it's going to have something to do with sugar or something like that. And this is an excitatory neurotransmitter, meaning it's kind of revving you up, getting you going, having an oversupply can overstimulate the brain. All right, so those are the neurotransmitters. Then we looked at a couple different types of neurons. So we have three main types of neurons that we are going to look at. First, we have sensory neurons, which as they, their name implies, they carry messages from tissues and sensory receptors to the brain and spinal cord. So the example we used in class and in the video that we watched was like if there's a spider on you, right? Your body is, the sensory neurons are sensing there is something crawling on me. It sends that message to the brain and the spinal cord. Doing this really fast, not, not as slowly as I'm describing it. Then you have the motor neurons. The motor neurons carry messages from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands. This would be the thing that like then says, oh my God, there's a spider on me. I need to slap it to get it off. And then you have the interneurons. Interneurons are neurons within the brain and spinal cord, and they communicate internally. So inter means internally, within, things like that. Okay. Now we're moving a little bit bigger. We talked about some systems. So we have the endocrine system. The endocrine system is a system that consists of chemical messengers. Um, it is the chemical messenger system that has our hormones that regulate a bunch of things like metabolism, growth, development, mood, and more. Here is a picture of our lovely endocrine system. The important things to remember about the endocrine system would be the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is the region that controls the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is the thing that secretes or like lets out all these different hormones and it affects some of the other different glands. We also have things, um, we have some other parts. We have the thyroid gland, which affects our metabolism, um, how we process like food and things like that in our body. The parathyroids, which help regulate the level of calcium in the blood. The adrenal glands, which help trigger flight or flight. I always say that wrong, fight or flight response. The pancreas, which helps regulate the level of sugar in the blood testes and the ovaries. We know what those do. Um, the main ones again to remember are the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. They are the two main things related to the endocrine system. Okay, so I skipped a slide. Okay. Uh, sorry. Here we go. So we also have the larger nervous system, which the endocrine system is a part of. So the nervous system is made up of kind of two routes. We have the peripheral, which is all the stuff kind of on the outside, right? Like the periphery means the outside. And then we have the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system contains everything that is not in the central nervous system, aka the brain and the spinal cord. So when we have our nervous system, as I just said, it's divided into two. That's we have this like flow chart here. So we first have peripheral and central. The central includes the brain and the spinal cord. We are going to get more into the brain, obviously, in the next few slides, um, which helps us with majority of our functioning. And then we also have the spinal cord. On the other side, we have the peripheral nervous system, which also does important things too. The peripheral, so peripheral nervous system is then further divided into other subcategories. So we have the autonomic one and then the somatic. 
The autonomic one controls self-regulated action of internal organs and glands, meaning things that the body just naturally does, like breathing, going to the bathroom, just like things that you naturally have to do, um, your heartbeat, things like that. The somatic one controls voluntary movements of the skeletal muscles. So somatic is more of what we control. Additionally, though, within the autonomic, that one is divided into two as well. We need the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic, sympathetic, sympathetic arouses, meaning it revs our body up, gets it going. Um, those automatic actions, it helps with those ones like running in a scary situation, get away with it or, or get away from it, or your heart racing faster or whatever it might be. Parasympathetic helps you calm down after that, you know, has been resolved. So um, before we dig a little bit deeper into the brain, we talked about how do we understand the brain and we have a lot of different um, structures, uh, not structures, we have a lot of different tools that help us um, look at the brain and what's going on in it. So first we talked about an EEG, which is, my dogs are fighting in the background, sorry. Um, we have an EEG, which is an electrical recording of electrical waves. Um, it is used to measure activity in the brain. So again, you see those waves. It's looking at how, what is going on, how you're using your brain. Then we have a CT scan, which takes x-ray photos of the brain. Um, so it's kind of like an x-ray scan for your brain, just as if you're getting an x-ray of like your ankle, if you sprained it or something. And it's used to reveal damage usually. Um, you can do it, obviously, if there's not damage, if they just want to see if your brain's healthy. But typically, they're not going to make you do that. Um, they, don't, they don't need to scan a, a healthy brain. Um, so they're using it to reveal damage. We have a PET scan. PET scan shows uh, brain. It scans for brain activity. So it's similar to an EEG in the, sense, in the sense that it's showing activity, but it's a little bit more specific. It shows each brain area's consumption of its fuel, of its chemical fuel, which is glucose. Next, we have an MRI, which uses magnetic fields, which is what the M stands for, and radio waves, the R, to produce computer-generated images of soft, soft tissue. So it's showing the brain anatomy. It's showing what the brain looks like, the different places um, in your brain, and how they're structured. So this would be like, if they're looking at it, they'd be like, whoa, man, this part of your brain is really small. What's going on there? And then finally, we have the fMRI, which also uses magnetic fields to reveal blood flow and therefore brain activity by comparing successive MRI scans. So it shows a series of different scans. It shows the function as well as its structure. So you'll see here in the pictures, it's showing us what the structure looks like as well as how things are working. So this one is really advanced. Um, and it's a great tool to use if you want to know a lot about what's going on in the brain. Okay, so now finally getting into the brain. So we have the oldest structures. As I've said, the brain basically developed from the bottom to the top. So the oldest parts of our brain deal with things that we've had to deal with as humans for a very, very, very long time. And those things would be like autom automatic survival functions. So we have the brain stem, um, which is the oldest part in the central core of the brain. It's responsible for our automatic survival functions like heart, breathing, things like that. Then we have the limbic system, which develops like right above that. It's the neural system located below the cerebral hemispheres. It's associated with emotions and drives. So our emotion and drives are pretty like basic things. They're these basic instincts. Um, and we'll talk about what each of these does. We've already talked about the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, actually, but we'll look at the amygdala and the hippocampus in a sec. So all these other parts of the brain, there's tons of them, right? There's lots of, <laughs> we have a lot of things going on in our brain and every part does something specific. Sometimes there seems like there's a little bit of overlap, but damaging one part of the brain can have a significant impact on a very specific part of who you are. 
So we have the pawns. Um, also, you're not going to have to label a part of the brain. There's never going to be a multiple choice question. It's like label the part of the brain or that's like, is the pawns above the medulla? <laughs> um, it's going to be more about like they might give you a scenario and they would say, um, if the pawns were like damaged in this situation, like how would this impact the person? Um, and they would say like, well, it would impact their ability to be able to move their arm or something like that, whatever it might be. Um, or it might literally just ask like, what, like, which of the following is the definition of this thing? So um, we have the pawns, which as I just kind of said, helps coordinate movements. So things like moving our arms or our legs to walk or whatever it might be. We have the medulla, which controls heartbeat and breathing really critical. So damage to this would be pretty fatal. We have the amygdala, which helps control emotions, especially rage and fear. The cerebellum, which kind of does a lot of things. It enables nonverbal learning and memory. It helps us judge time and discriminate sounds and textures, and it coordinates voluntary movements, so things that we choose to move. Again, the cerebellum does a lot, kind of does it all. We have the thalamus, which is different from the hypothalamus. The thalamus receives info from all the senses except smell and routes it to the higher brain regions that deal with seeing, hearing, tasting, and touching. Next, we have the hypothalamus, which we've already talked about. Um, it helps govern the endocrine system via the pituitary gland. It helps um, direct several maintenance activities like eating, drinking, body temperature, things that we need to do to stay alive, and it's linked to emotion and reward. We have the hippocampus, which processes conscious memories, so things that we need to remember. And that is it for those sections. Next, we're going to look at uh, the different kind of like areas, so the different cortexes and then the different lobes. So our brain is divided into two. We have the left and the right hemispheres. And on each side, we have the same stuff going on. So we have all of this on the left and we have all of this on the right. Each of these areas, these cortexes and these lobes do different things. So the cerebral cortex, which is, again, like most of this. <laughs> The cerebral cortex is the body's ultimate, I'm so sorry about my dogs, <laughs> is the body's ultimate control and info processing center. The motor cortex is at the back of the frontal lobe and it controls voluntary movement. Pretty, pretty simply put. Then we have the somatosensory cortex, which is at the front of the parietal lobes. It registers and processes body touch and movement sensations. We have the visual cortex, which is at the back of the occipital lobe. It receives info from your eyes. Again, pretty self-explanatory. And then we have association areas, which are kind of unique. And they are not involved in primary motor or sensory functions. So they don't help us with our sight or our sense of taste or whatever. But they do help us with these higher order kind of things, these higher mental functions, like learning, remembering, thinking, speaking. These are, this is why these areas are towards, again, kind of the front of the brain. They're up here more so, more so um, because they're things that have developed more over time that humans have needed as we have developed as a species. Um, more intelligent animals have increased or have larger association areas, essentially. So my dogs, who are currently fighting right now, there's they don't have a big association area. They're not really thinking about what they're learning in this current fight or what they're going to remember from it. They're not talking. They're just using their kind of animal instincts. Whereas we humans have a larger association area. You can kind of see it in this image here. Um, we have the rat, the cat, the chimp, and the human. We have a spectrum of species that we typically would say are more evolved or more intelligent. Um, as you can see, the association areas are these light pink areas. So obviously in the rat, it barely has any association areas. Cat has minimal ones. Chimpanzee has a slightly 
actually a pretty decent one. Um, obviously, we do believe evolutionary. We develop from, you know, species similar to this. Um, and then we have the human who has the most. Okay, so then looking at the different lobes. So I'm going to kind of go back to this picture. Sorry. So we have the frontal lobe here, parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. So the frontal lobe helps with cognitive functions and control of voluntary movement or activity. The temporal processes memories, integrating with them with sensations of taste, sound, sight, and touch. The parietal processes info about temperature, taste, touch, and movement. And the occipital helps with vision. All right. So moving past the parts of the brain and the structures, we then talked about how the brain is resilient, how it repairs itself. So something called brain plasticity. Brain plasticity is the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. So we watched the video of a young girl who had half of her brain taken out of her skull because she was having seizures. And while you might think, oh my God, she's losing half of her brain, the other part of the brain, the left hemisphere, I believe they took out the right, right? Um, it adapted almost immediately and started doing the things that the right used to do. And she lived a completely normal life, um, was able to walk, was able to dance, talk, all the things that she could have done before she was having the seizures. Brain plasticity occurs t just normally. Um, our brain is constantly trying to make sure it's whole and functioning and doing what it needs to do. Um, but it, it really happens after serious damage, but it's going to be more successful earlier in life. Our brain is more, more moldable as we're younger. Once we hit that, once our brain is fully developed, which is technically in our late twenties, um, it's a little bit harder for the brain to fully repair, um, for it to be as strong as it could be. So then we looked at this split or divided brain, which again is something that is not naturally occurring. So different from brain, brain plasticity, which can occur naturally, but is something that's often going to occur if you go through like an intense surgery like the young girl did. But a split or divided brain is something that does not occur naturally. Um, it is going to be the process of a surgery. So it's a condition that results from surgery and it isolates the brain's two hemispheres by severing the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum, again, is this large grouping of fibers that connects the brain's hemispheres. Um, it's like the thing that holds the two together and it carries messages between them. So when you sever that, it divides the brain. Important thing to remember is that the a divided brain is very, it's not common, it's very uncommon. Um, and it only happens again as a result of a surgery. We, everybody in our class and 99.9% .9 of human beings have a, what we would call a normal <laughs> brain, meaning it is undivided. Obviously everybody's brain is its own unique brain and <laughs> there might be other abnormalities to it, but it is normal in the sense that it is connected by the corpus callosum. So one of the things, and we saw this in the video that we watched um, with the experiment where they had the guy who did have a divided brain and they tested him and his ability to like draw with both hands or when they flashed something to his left hemisphere or to his right hemisphere, he was able to say it or he was able to draw it or he was able to process that um, it was fruit versus it was a face. Um, it, it shows that the two hemispheres are are different not in the way though that we've always thought of it like people have always said oh the left brain is for like people that are like analytical and the right is for creative creativity or whatever it might mean and that, that's not necessarily the case but what it does show is that they are specialized the left hemisphere helps us make quick literal interpretations um it helps with interpreting language it assists with us being able to speak Whereas the right hemisphere assists with visual perception, making inferences, so these kind of like larger, deeper things, and recognizing emotions. So again, like in the video, when they showed something to one side of the brain versus the other, he was able to do something 
but he wasn't able to do something else. So it shows us that there are these two very different things that we can't do. The last kind of chunk of things we looked at over the course of this unit were um, genetics and evolution and how genetics and evolution can be used to kind of understand uh, us biologically. So behavior geneticists, they basically study our differences and how genes impact them. So they are um, people that would say that a lot of who we are is really predetermined by the genes that we've inherited. Whereas obviously somebody who studies social cultural or humanistic psychology might say, maybe, but we have some agency too. Um, obviously making up our genes and making up who we are, we have to look at these, uh, these smaller units. So we have DNA, which is a complex molecule con containing the genetic info that makes up the chromosomes. We have genes, a unit of heredity that is transferred from a parent to offspring and determines some characteristics. Um, how genetically similar are humans? As we were all surprised to learn in class, we are almost identical. Um, we are 99.9% .9 made up of the same DNA, which again seems kind of insane having known, you know, a lot of people and seeing that they're all very different from us, but goes to show that 0.1% is really important and it makes us who we are. Heritability is, again, it's usually represented as this percentage. It is this the extent to which variation among individuals can be attributed to their differing genes. So it'd be like this particular gene is blank percent heritable, uh, meaning there's a per blank percent chance that it would be passed on. So how do genes influence our behavior? Well, they can in a lot of ways. Um, individual or small groups of genes can influence a lot of different complex traits, such as our intelligence, our happiness, and our aggressiveness. So it, you know, it isn't all that wrong to, <laughs> to think that we have inherited some of these things from our parents, uh, from future, from previous generations. But important thing to remember is, just because you do inherit certain traits or you do inherit you know, certain characteristics, that doesn't mean that it's set. Um, you are able to adapt as human beings. Our genes interact with our environments to influence our behavior. So even if you come from a parent who is maybe a little bit more aggressive, that doesn't mean that you are naturally and inherently going to be an aggressive person as well. It could mean that you go out of your way to learn how to not be aggressive and you challenge that. We as humans, again, have the capacity to learn, to adapt, um, and it's important to remember that. So how do psychologists determine how our genes impact our behavior? The main thing they do is they study twins who are raised separately and children raised by adoptive parents. This way they're able to see the impact of both nature and nurture. All right, final module 15, um, which was all about evolutionary psychology and its relation to biological bases of psychology. So we talked about natural selection. Um, this is the process whereby organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. A lot of times we think about this in terms of animals, right? Like a species, I always think of like birds because I feel like that's one of the earlier like Darwinian experiments, but a certain kind of bird has like a certain coloring and if it you know over time it doesn't adapt to that environment it could become more of um, it could become more susceptible to being prey it's going to die off and then it won't be able to it won't last it won't, it's it won't reproduce it won't go on um so we obviously like see that with the extinction of animals but humans too have evolved and developed in a way that we have had to adapt to our environments in order to survive and to keep the human race alive. So this is related to psychology and evolutionary psychology because um, essentially evolutionary psychologists seek to understand how our traits and um, our behavior tendencies are shaped by natural selection. So how the things that we have inherited, how the things that we do are shaped by the evolutionary things that we have naturally had to do in order to survive. 
So one of the things that evolutionary psychologists love to look at is gender differences. Um, and specifically, though, right, they're looking at, you know, how the human race continues on. So when we think about that, we are naturally thinking about thinking about sex, thinking about how we procreate. So a lot of evolutionary psychologists have done studies, um, mostly through surveys, case studies, interviews, things like that. So it's not as there might be some experiments in there, but um, they have found that typically in their studies that men tend to have a more recreational view of sexual activity, meaning it's something that, you know, you just do. <laughs> um, and typically they tend to approach more sexual partners. And again, from an evolutionary perspective, they would say, well, this is because they want to have more kids in order to ensure that the human race lives on. And men, fortunately for them, have a lot of sperm that they can use for a long time in order to do this. Um, whereas women, on the other hand, have a slightly more relational view of, of, of this process. <laughs> um, they typically want to commit to a relationship more so um, because women incubate and nurse their babies. Um, this when, when having one partner, this allows for more stability, it allows for the child's chances of survival. Um, if they have a potential partner that's more invested in the long term, like livelihood of this of this child. Um, now, this is all to say that we have evolved as a species. Um, and we are not just influenced by our natural drives and desires, right? We um, have agency, we're able to make decisions for ourselves, we're able to look at our sexuality and the way we perform it um, in very different ways than our, not even just our distant ancestors, but our recent uh, ancestors did. So there's a lot of criticisms with this perspective um, in saying that it doesn't really recognize the social and cultural influences around these ideas, um, right? If you grew up in a more like liberal area um, or you don't have as much of like uh, this kind of conservative, really strict gender kind of these gender norms, you might not think about the same way. You might say, you know what? I, I'm a woman and I can do as I want. I don't want to be tied down. I don't think about it this way or vice versa. Not every guy is out there trying to sleep with every person he sees. Um, it also doesn't allow, as I kind of mentioned before, it doesn't allow for people to take responsibility of their sexual behavior. So it, like, you know, somebody could use this as an excuse. Like a guy could be like, well, it's just evolution it's natural for me to 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 sleep with a bunch of people um or women you know saying it's natural that you know i have to be a mom in some ways an evolutionary psychologist would say yes it is because those are the two roles that we are biologically born i mean as a woman right you're biologically created to have a child and men are biologically created to help with that process however that's not for everybody, right? <laughs> um, you don't have to do that. You have responsibility in what you want and your decisions that you make related to your sexual behavior. We will talk way more about gender and break a lot of these stereotypes down later in the year. But that is it for all the modules. Obviously, I didn't talk about every single term. There are terms within the text that... I didn't focus on on. Um, likely, I'm not gonna. <laughs> there's not gonna be one on the quiz that we haven't talked about in class, though. However, that's not to say on the AP test there won't be some terms that maybe we didn't talk about. So it's important to review your notes to go through the um, the Quizlet slides or Quizlet um, flashcards, whatever you want to do. Also, reach out to me if you have questions about a term that I didn't go over, and you're like, "Oh my God, she never talked about this, and I'm so confused. I really want to know what this is." send me an email, text me, whatever you need. All right. Um, at the end, I added in two different videos um, from Crash Course that just kind of get a little bit deeper into some of the ideas that we talked about in this unit. So you can always watch those as well if they help you with your understanding. Crash Course is a great resource. There's tons of videos um, for this entire class that we will be watching every now and then. Okay. That's it. I'm done talking at you. I'm losing my voice. Um, <laughs> 
please let me know if you have any questions before the quiz. And um, that's it.